Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CSPI podcast. I'm here again with my uh, good friend, uh, Brian Kaplan. Uh, Brian, how are you doing? Fantastic, Richard. Glad to hear it. So we have a uh, so you have another book, uh, another collection of essays. This one, you know, with a with a new uh, essay, sort of leading off the whole thing. It's called "Don't Be a Feminist: Essays on uh, Genuine, Genuine Justice." Justice. Yeah. So how do you um, how do you how do you classify this book? You had one on labor econ. This one's not just about feminists. It's about genuine justice. But so how how, how do you how do you sort of conceptualize that? Right. Well, the first section is basically anti wokeness essays. But then I wanted to step back. The idea of genuine justice contrasted with social justice, so called. Well, that section is called the social injustice movement because I think it's a highly unjust movement. And then the other parts are related topics that I just thought fit in very well. So the next part is called Being Bakarian, where I talk about the economics of discrimination and what it means for understanding a lot of complaints about how society is unfair. Then I've got a section on the quest to live a moral life in an immoral society such as our own. Right. And and then you know, then I have another one just called, called Everyday Evil, just on just thinking about the ways in which the world we live is unjust, but we take it for granted and we just sort of accept it, which is pretty much the way that all human beings are, right? No matter how bad your society is, it's pretty unusual for people to sit around saying, God, this is a terrible place. I can't believe how bad people are. And yet a lot of them would have been right. So what do you do about that? Yeah, I mean the the way I sort of saw it, and this is not the way you officially uh, break down the book, is like you have this anti-social justice uh, thing, and you have this discrimination thing, sort of puts it was just sort of uh, is under the same umbrella. Uh, but then you have, I think it's like you, that can be like seen as sort of a critique of the left, and then the second half could be sort of seen as a critique of the right. It's a critique mm-hmm. of uh, uh, the uh, morality or the immorality of of borders and immigration restrictions mm-hmm. and things like that. But you don't you don't classify it like that, right? You, you say uh, everyday evil and mm-hmm. uh, you know clean hands, and the clean hands thing I think is is sort of in that social justice theme. Have you ever thought about like that, like you know? left-wing moral idiocy and then right-wing moral idiocy and then just making those like the two broad topics of the book? Yeah, you know, I could do it that way. I mean, my general approach is I don't want to call anyone idiots. Well, whatever. <laughs> trying, I mean, you know what I'm saying. Trying to, you know, trying to get readers. I mean, a lot of what I'm doing, I, I think, in this book is trying to take, you know, re, re, I mean, you know, think about it this way. I think in the, in the first part, I, I really want to establish a lot of credibility with conservative and right-wing readers so that you know, towards the later part of the book, they realize, look, I'm not your enemy. I'm not someone that is down on you. I think you're making some important mistakes, but it's not. For, I, I say this from a position of appreciation, and maybe we can actually make some progress. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's helpful um the uh so yeah let's just start with the you know the big one the one this is the only essay uh, don't be a feminist this is the only one that's not um wasn't uh written anywhere else right mm-hmm. we're correct yeah uh and uh just summarize the argument and then you know we'll talk about it a little bit very good i mean just for background so the essay is called don't be a feminist a letter to my daughter and this is the way that i frame it i actually write it as if i'm speaking to my daughter who is now only 10 so she's not really ready for it but I've been thinking about this for quite a while, but realizing, hmm, I mean, one day my daughter's going to ask me about this stuff, and what am I going to tell her? And what I start off is saying, well, what does feminism even mean? Right? There are a bunch of dictionaries you can find where they just say it's the view that women should be treated as the economic, political, social equals of men. But here's the problem. We've got public opinion data on this question showing that almost all non-feminists in our society agree with that, which means this is not really a Good definition. In fact, it's a definition that seems deliberately controversial in order to act like people that aren't feminists disagree with something that almost everyone agrees with. So then I step back and say, well, that's not really a good definition. In the same way as saying feminism is the belief that the sky is blue, it's just a terrible definition of feminism. Yeah, they believe it, but who doesn't? And I say, so what is it that really distinguishes feminists from other people? And I say it is the belief that our society treats men more fairly than women or that our society treats women less fairly than men. And at that point, I say, all right, well, that is something that we can talk about. It's something we can think about. Let's go and think about the prima facie ways that this would be true. Let's think about the prima facie ways that the opposite would be true and that our society treats men less fairly than women. And then this is where my training as an economist really comes in. Say, well, wait a second. Just the fact that two groups are treated unequally is really crummy evidence that one group is treated unfairly compared to the other. 
I mean, look at me. I have no awards in basketball at all. Right? You might say, ah, oh, that's because I've been treated unfairly. That is a theory. But another theory is I have terrible performance in basketball. So in a world that was completely fair, I would have exactly what I have, which is nothing in that area. Uh, so then I try to go through the social science on a long list of these issues and come away saying, like, overall, like, there's this very little sign that women are treated less fairly than men in our society. There are few issues where it looks like men have an advantage, few issues where it looks like women have, have an advantage. In the end, I say the main thing that really settles it is just decades of hyperbolic accusations about how badly men have been treating women that really don't check out. I say, look, you know, even if it started off even, if two sides are treated equally well, but one, except that one has to deal with a lot of baseless accusations, then we say the side that endures the baseless accusations being treated worse. So you have, so you, so you have a you know, part of it is the, you know, this uh, pay gap stuff, you know, the, mm-hmm. the yeah. literature on, on how that is, you know, missing, missing important things. Um, then you could, you could talk about how men are the victims of, you know, violence and uh, drug yeah. abuse and all that stuff. You can talk about natural differences between men and women. I guess the thing, you know, the thing that I, uh, the thing that I would um, that I took away from the essay, and the way I like to sort of approach these things, is I think that you know I have a problem with feminism and feminism using the definition that you use, but it's not necessarily about the fact that their facts are wrong, which is you know mm-hmm. that they they often are, or their moral you know their mm-hmm. their moral arguments don't 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 logically you know don't logically uh, cohere, they don't make sense. It's it's more that look. It, even if the even if the feminists were right on the empirics, if there was a twenty percent, mm-hmm. you know, wage premium paid to paid to men or, or something, mm-hmm. um, which uh, completely unrelated to job performance. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Let's yeah, it was it was unrelated to job performance. Let's say there was, it was just, there was pure discrimination mm-hmm. uh, going on. Society didn't treat men and women differently uh, based on this. Well, I mean, there's two there's two things with that. First of all, we all belong to you know collectives that we can you know we can uh, identify with, and we could say we're treated unfairly or, or not. So there's a you know there's a lot of data on uh, tall men you know making more money than short men. Maybe it's discrimination. Maybe it's something else. I don't know. I've never looked at the data. There's not a lot of interest in it. But you know, short men don't just walk around, or maybe they maybe they do. They see it under their breath. But it, it's it's much less prominent than than feminism, right? They're much less common to build an identity off of that, become angry about it, see that as central to their politics. So my first response to you know why you shouldn't be a feminist is this is this you know identity sort of way of looking at the world and making these comparisons in the first place and letting it sort of drive your you know how you react to people in your uh, social and political worldview I think that that's um, I think that that's unhealthy um, and then you know the the other the other problem um, you know the you know the other problem with this stuff is also sometimes people do are treated uh, uh, unfairly at an individual level, but because of statistically true reasons or statistical mm-hmm. discrimination. So mm-hmm. I, as a man, am treated as more violent um, than a woman. Um, and it doesn't bother me because I am. And maybe there's something like that where women are treated differently than men. And maybe it's not fair to all women, all women, you know, women who don't conform to the, uh, to the norm, but like, so what we just deal with it. Um, so like, you know, what's, what's wrong with making a case? Don't be a feminist like that. Like you shouldn't even be looking at the empirics here. There's something, so there's something unhealthy about the the way that feminists frame these issues. I mean, I would just start by saying there's a low hanging fruit argument of if the facts are just against them, that I don't need to make the, I don't need to make the argument. I think that's probably a good part of what's, of what's motivating me or what's, what, what am I thinking? I do in the piece talk about the effects of feminism on the adherent, where I say that it leads to an exaggeration of antipathy and self-pity, antipathy for outgroups and self-pity for yourself, which I do say, you know, regardless of the facts, is just not a constructive attitude to have. And it is a lot better to try to look at other people as potential allies and to figure out the best way to work with what you've got. Uh, I mean, also in the piece, I do talk about the societies where I think you really, women really do have a very reasonable complaint, like Saudi Arabia is one of the one that's very obvious. I mean, as to what would you what would you go and tell Saudi women if you were talking to them totally off the record and everyone feels like they're not going to get decapitated for speaking frankly? And they say, yeah, look, I'm stuck in a country where I'm permanently under the guardianship of my dad. I disagree with him. I think that he's wrong about a lot of stuff. I can't flee the country. I can't drive. I need his permission to get a job. He won't give it to me. 
right? This is one where on the one hand you say, well, don't hate all men and don't feel sorry for yourself. All right, good. But still, that's a point saying, yeah, like, this is a pretty screwed up system here. You got a point. Yeah. Yeah. They would, they certainly would have, they certainly do have a grievance there. I think there's, I guess there's two ways to be a feminist. So you say, don't be a feminist. There's being a personal feminist mm-hmm. in your personal life. And I guess my argument would work uh, either, you know, it would, it would work for that one. You know, just don't, even if society treats you unfairly, don't hate all individuals and, you know, mm-hmm. don't let it control your life. Even for a Saudi woman, I'd mm-hmm. say, you know, you're, you'd be healthier uh, psychologically if you accepted sort of the system that you're in. Um, and then there's the political question, whether or not be a political feminist. And I think you're, you're sort of doing both. You're, you're, mm-hmm. You think you could take the factual arguments and by, uh, by convincing someone of the factual arguments, they won't be a personal feminist and they won't be a mm-hmm. political uh, feminist, right? Um, I guess the yeah you know, the problem with the, the low hanging fruit argument um, uh, for me is, is sort of like you know it's very you know it's very fact dependent. So you can if you if you wanted to be a feminist, you could you know you could take these facts and you could you know you could you could find some things there to 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 um, to be a feminist. Like you know for example, I'm sure there are ways that society responds to say aggression and women differently from men. So like take it, take the alternative, like society is more accepting of women crying than men crying. Right. And I'm sure there are traits that they're more accepting in men that are very off putting in women. I'm sure that's true. Um, Is that something to be, you know, angry about, or do you just, you know, sort of live with these statistical realities that human nature responds to? And you know, that's it. You just have to say that there's going to be unfair. Like someone could, I'm saying I, what I'm trying to say. I think is somebody could take your facts, and depending on what they care about and how they want to balance, and exactly you know what studies or what research they look to, they could come to a different conclusion, right? And then it would be at the point of saying, okay, um, it's, it's just not healthy. It's not healthy to focus on either these statistical discrimination or these uh, you know these broad you know uh, uh, these broad sort of patterns of unfairness. Right. So yeah, I mean, you could go and say, yeah, well, there's a hundred different things, and on ninety of them, where we've got parity, there's five where men are doing better, five where five where women are doing better. But the five things where men are doing better are super important to me. Yeah. Oh yeah. So exactly. I'm going to live my life with antipathy and self pity, and that's where I guess there'd be two things saying, well, look, like you've got to just step back and look at the overall picture. Like just saying that 100 percent that we're 100 percent of things are not to your advantage is a pretty crazy standard for claiming that you're being treated badly. But yeah, then I think you could also make your point of even if that those things were so important, it would be more productive for you to try to focus on doing the most you can with your with your own life. Uh, but again, you know, like you know, what I would say is that you know, like I said, I am thinking about talking to my daughter about this and that is sort of my immediate imagined audience. Yeah, so for my daughter was saying, yeah, like you know, the kids at school were being really mean to me. You know, my reaction is, you know, part of my reaction is, well, people are going to be mean and you got to learn to get over that. Part of my reaction is, well, were they really being mean? What exactly did they do? I say that these are both constructive avenues to go to. And then finally, of course, if it's really bad, like some kid trying to shove you down the stairs, it's like, all right, we're going to do something about this. But don't automatically assume the worst and just think that someone who accidentally bumped into you was trying to do you harm. So these are all all parts of the conversation that I would have with her, and I think it's a reasonable way of thinking about anyone's complaints. Is well, just like you know, is you know, general, is it really reasonable to think that your treatment is so bad? And then, you know, like you can, if you step back, you realize like some of the things may be bad, but there's other things that you have an advantage of. And then, you know, finally say like, even if it really were like that, what's the best way of coping with it and handling it? Right? And yeah, I think that. So much of what we think of as feminism is about having a very unconstructive attitude, but also just one that is so harsh. I mean, again, you know, like you might step back and say, well, feminism has really worked because men are afraid of feminists and they're afraid of doing anything that would bother women because of this movement. I say, well, maybe that's going to backfire your face and then maybe it won't, but it's just wrong to treat other people that way. Uh, is it is ten too young to? So your your daughter, she, you think she's too young? Is ten is ten too young? Or she's too young to read. Uh, she's too young to read the essay. Not too young to talk about it. Yeah. So yeah, I've uh, had a bunch of conversations with her about it, but I don't think she's got the patience to sit down and read an essay on something. Th- there must have been, you know, there must have been some motivation for you to to sit down and of all the things you could have said, don't be a socialist, mm-hmm. don't be a Black yeah. Lives Matter activist, don't be a nativist. You know, why was why was uh, what motivated you to to write? Don't be a feminist. Two things. So first of all, my daughter is statistically really likely to be a feminist based upon demographics, right? So you know, she's you know, 
woman, you know, so we, woman of 10, or whatever. <laughs> so she's a you know, 10 year old in a very left wing area of the country in a demo, you know, like, like in an ed, in a uh, education socioeconomic class where young women would very reliably become feminists. So that's part of it. Second of all is my view that this is a very harmful doctrine for her to accept in terms of the antipathy and self-pity, but also just treating other people unjustly, you know, starting with males in her own family. Right. And then finally, I just say the arguments in favor of feminism are so flimsy that I think one good essay is what it would take to, at minimum, just give you healthy doubt for the rest of your life. And I think actually this is something where to someone that is reasonably smart and comes to it with an open mind and doesn't hate me, I think I can actually persuade you. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, one thing you do, one thing you do in the, uh, through the collection of essays is you sort of, you make this, um, uh, you so I think you have some very, you know, interesting more, you know, I, I think you, de- what, I think one thing when you do, you say you, when you earlier, when you said, you don't like, you try to approach people from, okay, I'm your friend, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I, you know, you could sort of appeal to people that way. I think your arguments on, uh, uh, immigration, I think are sort of, you know, are, are sort of ideally, uh, su- suited for that. So, um, I'm glad you say that, Richard. I thought you were going to say the opposite and like, oh man, I totally failed. No, I, I think, I think you're good. I think that I, you know, I, I see people who are realistic being, um, uh, I think I, I think my view on immigration moved from pe- seeing people. I think partly in your your uh, a lot of your essays, I think had a had an effect on me, mm-hmm. uh, particularly the fact that you were willing to take IQ seriously. I mean, the fact mm-hmm. that a lot of these yeah. people don't. I just think they're delusional, and these are the people who are talking such crazy stuff about other racial issues. I said, oh, well, this is just another racial issue, and they're just. And by the way, that was a that was a section that my publisher wanted me to cut, and I stood my ground again. We oh, good for you. Good for good for you because it's it's so it's so necessary. It, it, how about the, the how about in the uh, open borders book? Did they want them? Did they want you to cut the IQ stuff there too? Because no, 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 all- no, that that is that's exactly where they wanted me to cut it. No, no, no one else is. I mean, there wasn't isn't any other forum where they really where they. I mean, I guess there's a couple of articles, but you now it was a publisher for the book Open Borders where they said, "Look, we're not comfortable with this. We should probably just cut it." And I said, "Look, I can't make the, make the argument well unless I do this." And they said, "Okay." Yeah. What are they, what are they afraid of in a situation like that? That someone's just going to say, well, you even mentioned this bad argument. You know, yeah. gonna- I mean, look, I have talked to multiple people who are very left wing, who work on IQ and they've said, Pe- my friends tell me not to work on the issue at all. Even to go and mention it dignifies it with, you know, with, 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 uh, with attention. And so you know, like you are tainted merely by discussing it, even if you disagree. So, yeah, there, there is, just a bizarre level of antipathy to a pretty common sense idea, which is people vary in their intelligence. Yeah. And yeah, especially if you could use it for, you know, to make it because and so the people who think, you know, who see IQ is real and see that a lot of the mainstream narrative on race is, is BS. Uh, they naturally, I think, fall into this sort of immigration uh, restrictionist mm-hmm. camp. Uh, but you don't. And so can you explain sort of like, so I, you know, I, I had a conversation with Amy Wax on one of our last mm-hmm. podcasts. And yeah, yeah. Was- very, very good conversation. Like, I mean, as I said on Twitter, like, I'm really impressed. You kind of stumped her. <laughs> well, better, well, not an easy woman to stump. No, she's, 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 <laughs> yeah, she's obviously brilliant. Yeah. I, I think, um, well, I mean, there's no, there's never any, I mean, there's never any dialogue between like, you know, I, these people who are restrictionists and people who take this, you know, sort of uh, IQ realist uh, perspective and like people who, and then just the, the other people just want to shut debate down. Right. So it, it's yeah. sort of, the, you know, there's not a lot of people who straddle uh, these worlds and it can be very interesting and new um, when you hear this stuff, but yeah. Can you summarize the, the uh, argument of why, because yeah, the correlation between believing IQ is important and wanting to restrict immigration is probably like one, I mean, from what I see online. So can you just sort of explain how you could just be, believe in IQ, believe in IQ, even IQ differences, and then be in favor of uh, uh, open immigration policies? Yeah. I mean, I think that correlation is probably more like 0.3 or 0.4, but among very smart people who are against immigration, then you see yeah, uh, yeah, of course. This, this pattern. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's, there's a few things to say. I mean, one, of course, is just to take out and, and get a good look at a global map of IQ. And what you'll see there is that we very strictly limit immigration, even from countries that have higher average IQ than us. So, uh, you know, most obviously, East Asia. Right? This is where you're like, hmm, well, 
why is it that you're trying to stop immigration from other places instead of being super enthusiastic about immigration from higher IQ countries? Well, I think I think the, the argument there would they would be just as a practical uh, uh, just as a practical reality um, our immigration system now is, and then illegal. I remember what did Amy Wax say? Amy Wax just said, "Hey, oh, they're white Democrats." So lost in like yeah, East yeah. Asian immigration too. I, I think that's the the. Opposition to illegal immigration, a third world, is stronger than opposition to Amy. Although she, uh, the, uh, the first world immigration, but with yeah, with Amy, it's it's both. But oh uh, yeah, go ahead. Right. All right. So anyway, that's just one one thing worth pointing out. Is just look at the map. It's not true that all the areas that are poor and would likely send us a lot of immigrants are low IQ. Although a bunch of them are. Right, yeah. Second thing is just you know, basic comparative advantage. It is not true that people of below average IQ are of negative value. I mean, it's you know, one thing to say that people with low IQ have some additional problems, but saying that someone has some additional problems does not mean that their very existence is a negative. Like Charles Manson, his existence is a negative, but you know, the janitor who works at your office, if he dropped dead, would that would you say, oh, it's a great thing for society that, that janitor <laughs> I just died? <laughs> I mean, now, again, I think that there are some people would say, look, it's not polite to say that it was good that he died, but yeah, it was good that he died. It's like, well, what was good about it exactly? What was that guy doing that was so awful? He was you know, performing a useful function. And again, right. remember that in a world well, what, where what, you, you, what, everyone is of the I, IQ of Einstein, then who's, what is the IQ of the guy who takes out the trash? It's Einstein's IQ. Yeah. So one, one thing I've seen a lot of people say is that they'll look at net, um, uh, net tax burden. So they'll say the average person who's, you know, making 30,000, you know, the average slow IQ person, you know, uh, they pay a lot more taxes than they take it. I, I don't doubt that's true. Poor people don't pay a lot of taxes and poor people get uh, benefits. Uh, so how do you, how do you respond to that? Right. So, I mean, st- I would start by responding and saying, look, you're not wrong, right? It's true that people of higher IQ on average pay a lot more taxes, but uh, to, again, even from a totally fiscal point of view, does not show that they are net negative, especially because so much government spending is what economists call non-rival, which means that its cost doesn't really depend on population or doesn't depend so much. So you need to go and adjust the numbers for that. And when you do, then at least in the U.S., it does not look like the immigrants that we are getting are definitely not large net negatives. The uh, you know, National Academy of Science, Sciences says that the average immigrant we get is actually a net fiscal positive. But... The deeper point, as I think you've mentioned, Richard, is that looking only at fiscal effects is missing the main thing that people do, which is produce stuff. So yeah, that you know the uh, the janitor, and it, like it may be that he actually is a modest a modest net consumer of government services, even after we make adjustments for non rivalry. But he also is someone who is producing valuable goods, which allows people who are of higher IQ to go and specialize in high IQ activities and then enrich the world and themselves to a greater degree. So again, this, you know, this thought experiment of in a world of Einstein's, what's the IQ of the person who takes out the trash? It's an Einsteinian IQ. What a waste. What a terrible waste of talent. But now the part of the immigration IQ book that I felt very proud of and most proud of was this. Uh, how much of the lower IQ that we see in the poorest countries is actually caused by environmental effects of growing up in extreme deprivation. I have a whole book on nature versus nurture based upon first world twin adoption studies saying that very little, if any, of the adult IQ gap within rich countries can be explained by growing by, by just by the effects of growing in poverty. But it's important to remember this is a very restricted sample. So what would we actually see if we would go and measure the effect of severe deprivation on IQ? Uh, This is one where, as far as I can tell, there are just zero standard twin or adoption studies on this very point. But I did track down a bunch of high-quality studies of the effect of transnational adoption on IQ. And in particular, these are usually ones that look at what happens when you go from the third world to Scandinavia, where they're really good at keeping data. And, and, And that data also includes the age at adoption. So we can go and compare kids that are adopted into Sweden from Ethiopia when they're 10 versus 10 days. The punchline of all of this is that at minimum 40% of the IQ gap between poor and rich countries is environmental, which should not be surprising because the deprivation is just so severe. Right. And essentially the method that I use since I did is to say this, assume that those kids that are adopted from the third world would have had the average IQ from their own country how much better do they wind up doing if they are adopted at birth in Sweden? And that gives us 40%. 
And actually, that is probably an underestimate of how much gain we've got because if you are in a third world orphanage, you're probably actually from a very poor third world family. You would have been even you would have been well below your national average. So again, it could very well be that say sixty or seventy percent of the IQ gap that we see in poor countries really is environmental. Uh, people will then flip out and say, "You're supposed to say a hundred. Like I can't honestly say a hundred, so I'm not going to say hundred. <laughs> but again, if you care about IQ, just saying, look, you're like we've got something that could go and wipe out half of that IQ gap. And it just consists in letting their family move to a rich country so they can grow up there. If you care about IQ, you should care about that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're increasing the global IQ. You're increasing the global yeah. phenotypic IQ by, uh, yeah, bringing people to first world countries. That, that's right. Uh, what about the, you know, increasing the phenotypic IQ, not the genotypic uh, IQ. Yeah. Uh, phenotypic, yeah. Uh, the, um, uh, I guess the other argument, I mean, the one that I struggle with a little bit more is what about what about what about crime rates? I mean, there are some countries where in these Scandinavian countries, and yeah, um, where, which they start out with very low crime, and the immigrants, you know, they they have a they have a very high crime rate uh, relative to natives. This this is a cost, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and your language is exactly re- correct relative to natives. Yeah. So here's the here's the thing in the U.S it very much looks like immigrants have lower crime rates than natives. In Europe, it looks like they got higher crime rates than natives. There's a pretty simple story, which is that Americans on average have really high crime rates. Europeans have really low crime rates and immigrants are better than us, than bit, but worse than them. But then when you look at how low severe European crime rates are, then it's reasonable to say, yeah, having double your really low crime rate just isn't that bad. It is a negative. It's totally reasonable to go and subtract it when you're thinking about what the net effect is. But again, they really, but to go in and treat that as decisive is as crazy as saying that we don't want to have male babies because they've got 10 times the crime rate of female babies. Yeah. yeah we, dudes are violent compared to women, but most, most of us aren't going to kill anyone. Most of us aren't going to commit any severe violent crime to go and say, let's get rid of them because they have this multiply elevated crime rate is, uh, is an overreaction, even though the basic point that men are violent is sound, relatively speaking, we're violent. Yeah. The, well, the, yeah, I mean, I, I, when you said that, you know, if you double from a low base, that's maybe not important. I sort of think maybe maybe it is because I think there's a, sort of a threshold level where you're basically a society with no crime and then you get to be a society mm-hmm. with some crime, right? I think there are some societies, say, East Asia, yeah. where the crime is effectively zero. Like I think in Korea, you could probably leave your laptop uh, on the sidewalk and probably pick it up the, the next mm-hmm. day. I mean, there's zero crime. In, so if Japan or Korea, let's say their crime rate increased by 50%, maybe it would be big deal well maybe not like you know the u.s if it increased 50 percent yeah. that's your situation but let's say u.s increased by the same absolute amount mm-hmm. right so you add that to the u.s it doesn't it doesn't change much our inner cities are already, you know violent you know war zones but in korea it would, it would be a big deal so you know maybe a korean nationalist or japanese nationalist would say we have something very special and fragile here and we, we sort of want to preserve it hmm. i guess i start by saying i get where you're coming from but there is a standard way that economists have of measuring how much people actually care about crime. It basically consists in looking at rents in areas that are otherwise similar, but have different crime rates. And what you can see is that people all around the world do not place anything close to an infinite value upon getting crime down to zero. I mean, honestly, I will say that right here in Fairfax, Virginia, where I am working, my worry about crime is already near zero. I know like it's probably at 10 times at least what it is in Japan. But again, it's at such a rounding, a rounding air level that I don't worry about it. I think hardly anybody does worry about it around here to say that there'd be some immense value in getting from where we are down to nothing. And it'd be worth going and upending our society in order to do that. just seems quite crazy to me. I mean, it's also one where I just don't see really anyone acting this way with their behavior. There are some ultra low crime areas of the U.S. that you can move to if you really care about it that much. I just don't see much sign that these areas are places where many people actually want to move to. I mean, it's totally true people want to move from violent inner cities to suburbs. That's at a level where it matters enough. But once you're at the level of an American suburb, I just don't see that getting down to the Japanese level is all that important. Rather, I think that it's a typical symbolic issue where people claim that it, that it means the world to them, even though their actions do not show that. Yeah. 
you know, what about the what about the sort of uh, cultural diversity argument? Is like you have these nations and they're sort of different. And you know, sometimes countries can become you know sort of similar. And maybe there's you know the, the, there's some kind of you know sort of like it's like biological diversity. You want to preserve something because there could be some challenge humanity is going to face in the long run uh, that we can't foresee right now. So you want there to be a Japan, you want there to be, uh, I don't know, Israel and Australia, uh, Kenya and, and, so, and so on. Uh, does, you know, does that sort of, does that... Uh, yeah. the, uh, we want to preserve Kenya the way it is? <laughs> That's just, probably, probably not. That, 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 that that sounds like, yeah. Yeah. like, I mean, honestly, like the whole point of economic development is to reduce diversity among countries. Like, oh, you are, you're losing a little bit. It's true. But compared to what you're gaining, I just don't see that it's remotely worthwhile to go and preserve most 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 cultures on Earth as they traditionally existed. I mean, honestly, you know, like you know, the traditional European culture of 1800 is just totally gone forever. Right? There's nothing like it anywhere anywhere in the world. The European well, there's plenty of European descendants, but they just don't live the way that they did back then. You might say, isn't that a shame? We could have preserved this in the case of a very rare scenario where it's really important to have the right kind of collar or something like that. But I would just say that this is putting way too much weight on very low risk. I mean, I had this debate with Nassim Taleb where he's just so big on refusing to assign probabilities or use expected value theory and just say, look, we can't talk, we can't talk in that way. And like, of course we can talk in that way. There's no other reasonable way to talk. If we really talked your way, then there be then then you like couldn't eat anything because it's like how do I know this meal isn't poisoned? Like I can't be absolutely certain, so I'm not going to eat. And so what what does he say about that? I, I don't think he's really got an answer to it, other than just to say, look, you're you're misunderstanding me. I'm like I'm not misunderstanding you. This is just a logical application of this refusal to assign probabilities, refusal to do expected value, and just say like we got like we have to be really worried about tail risk. And it's like look. You, the nice thing about tail risk is that it's lower than regular risk. So we should do less about tail risk than about the equally serious high probability risks. And then there's a lot of things that are just so remote that we really should just probably not worry about them at all. Um, you know, even though, um, you know, it could be a problem. I mean, um, you know, in my education book, I mentioned the show Hoarders. Have you ever seen it, Richard? I know you're a pop culture guy. I've seen I've seen a few episodes, yeah. Yeah, so, that, so like like if you go and talk to a hoarder, their whole house is full of garbage, and you just ask them like, "Why do you have a hundred milk cartons?" And they they often will just give a totally true answer. It's like I might need it, I might need it. It's like I guess it's possible, but what are the odds if you refuse to go and talk about the probability you need a hundred milk cartons? Then you are going to be in a house full of all kinds of ridiculous garbage. So. You, it's very important to think numerically, to be numerate, and to say, look, if something is a really small risk, I'm not going to assign a big symbolic value to it. I'm just going to try to calm down and realize, like, it isn't just that other people don't care. You probably don't even care that much either. I mean, if you've ever looked at your Asian tourists in America, I haven't, I haven't noticed them looking afraid. It's like, oh my God, what's going to happen to me? I'm in America. I did once have a Swedish student who said that his fellows in Sweden warned him, watch your back in the airport. They have shootouts there all the time. <laughs> and well, that was one where he just came back and said, look, you're totally wrong and crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. And I said, you know, I think we know a little better about American airports and the shootouts there than someone who has lived there for a years. It's like, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it really depends on, I think the American the American crime problem is that like we have inner cities in this country and cities you know are as an economist you of course know cities are you know there there's all kinds of uh, economic benefits to having people clustered closer together um, we have some sort of prime real estate in this country that's just mm-hmm. usable um, have you seen that recent effective um, uh, altruism essay I think was on the less wrong website um, about uh, the economic cost of crime and just how sort of the social cost of the U.S. and how massive. Yeah, was it the Ben Southwood one? Yeah, yeah, there was one that, and then there was a uh, there was a follow up by a different guy named Sam uh, something um, on the less wrong website making similar uh, similar mm-hmm. points. Um, and yeah, I think the concentration of crime of where it is in the United States in particular, I mean, I think has a huge effect and it would be worth getting it down. And actually this is a, if anything, this is a case for um, immigration because this is, this is the Ron Unz article is that the immigrants move into the inner cities and they make them, uh, 
safer and maybe those you know the more crime poor populations go somewhere else uh but you know they don't it's not as damaging for them not to be in the uh in the inner city so oh look you have uh you have chicago chicago is you know livable people could actually live in chicago people could live in uh parts of los angeles um so this is actually yeah this is another i think an argument for immigration i think it's uh yeah, we're yeah. Our, our, I think I, I would. I, I guess I would. I would poo poo the effect of uh, the social cost of crime in the U.S. just because of where it's concentrated uh, in in the big cities. Yeah, meaning like like the U, the U.S. level looks quite bad compared to almost any other rich country. So totally, we're talking about. Uh, still, I would step back and say that this best measure we have is just how much extra would people pay to live in otherwise identical areas with different levels of crime. And that I think is a very good way of capturing at least the feelings of the people that are personally present there. Now, you know, when we're going over reasons to think about crime being more costly, I mean, like my main reaction to that is, okay, like this is a good essay. You make a bunch of good points, but you're doing the confirmation bias thing of only listing reasons why we are underestimating the cost of crime and you're not thinking about ways that we are overestimating. Again, from an economic point of view, the key thing to think about is, well, if someone is poor, then they attach less value to things, right? And since crime tends to be concentrated among the poor, this is actually a reason to reduce the dollar value. A lot of people don't want to count dollar valuation, but again, ultimately, I don't see any decent alternative to doing it that way. Because, you know, you'll say, look, um, there's someone in a poor country who doesn't seem to worry a lot about cancer risk. Yeah, well, there's a good reason they don't worry much about cancer risk. They got much bigger problems. So you as an outsider are going to say that they need to go and care a lot more about lung cancer than they do when they are dealing with much more real and present dangers. So that is one. And then obviously there's also hedonic adaptation that there are some people who seem to adapt to this stuff. I don't know that I would very well, but other people just don't seem to care very much. You really can see people that can totally afford to live in much lower crime areas who stay in urban areas just because they love the amenities so much. And this is one where I'm like, hmm, that's not what I would choose. Mm -hmm. Seems strange to me. Mm -hmm. But for me to say that your valuation of the crime is wrong and mine is right, it's like, well, seems more like what like, you just don't care that much i guess the, the, the economic way of uh, sort of calculating the the cost here is that like okay so you take chicago for example you have uh, the cost of say a house in uh crime ridden inner city is chicago and then you have one in um suburb somewhere which has a much lower crime rate i guess you'd have to control for everything yeah, else you know, the, you know, the problem with the comparison is you're not going to see two houses in those two areas that are that are that are comparable so you probably want to go and look at say you know like there's there's Basically, same area, except once in an Hispanic neighborhood, once in a black neighborhood, and so the Hispanic neighborhood is way lower crime, but the physical characteristics of the home are the same. That's really where you're getting identification in the statistics. Mm -hmm. But if if there if there if there's like a so strong social sort of uh, pressure towards you know segregation between the the races, you might just be they, they might just be independent markets, right? Mm -hmm. The black guy's not going to move in the Hispanic neighborhood and vice versa. Right. I mean that's that's where you could go and actually get data on the racial breakdown of the of the neighborhood, and so you can say, well, this one is sixty forty, that's forty sixty, and then but you could actually match match two that are forty sixty. And then say, yeah, but still this one, for whatever reason, has lower crime. Otherwise, the physical structures seem the same. Um, of course, in the real world, the data is going to suck a lot more than what I'm saying. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, but on the, on the other hand, this is like the best that we've got. It's a lot better than just someone speculating and saying, oh, man, crime's really, really, really bad. Yeah. <laughs> Versus, well, how much? I mean, I mean, honestly, like in that conversation, if someone doesn't like the system work, to say, all right, well, how much would you pay to go and live in a neighborhood that where we reduce the crime down to Japanese levels? Right now, if you're living in South Central Chicago, probably a lot. <laughs> yeah. But if you're living in Fairfax, Virginia, then it's like, I don't know, like another fifty bucks a month, maybe yeah. tops. Yeah. yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think you'd have. To, I think you'd have to pay me to live in South Side of Chicago. I mean, it's really bad. I was at the University of Chicago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes. Oh, yeah. You actually were there. So, were we on campus or like how? I uh, I live by, well I uh, my parents' house I live in the suburbs so I would just drive there it was about a thirty minute ah. drive and I would drive through actually though the worst parts of the uh, some of the worst parts of the inner yeah. city so it's not even it's not that pleasant even to drive through you see a lot of, uh, a, lot of a lot of stuff but it's it's during the day so it's, it's safe enough to drive but yes students would be afraid to to just walk a block. You know, the, you know, the law school is at the very tip of the campus. Um, so if you walk south one block, you're, you're right in the you're right in the ghetto. Um, and yeah, students I, mean, I, I was there a couple of years ago and I had been warned about how terrible it was. It didn't look that bad to me. I was actually pleasantly surprised, whereas Yale, on the other hand, 
Which part you know, of the campus? What I think of as the real dump. Well, <laughs> Sorry, where, Yaleys. Yeah. Well, which part of the campus were you in? I was all over, actually. I was in the law school. I was in like the main quad. I actually was staying in a hotel, tw- like twenty minute walk away. So I mean, I did, this is one before my sons were applying to school, and I said, right, well, we're going to stay in this hotel, and we're going to walk from here to campus. And if you're too terrified to do it, then we shouldn't apply here. Mm-hmm. And we walked for twenty minutes. We're like, we're here. Where was we, we never got to the part that we thought was really bad. Now I have no doubt that a local could actually walk me to the really bad part. What's what street was this hotel on? Number. Do you remember? If you just go and Google it, it was wherever the Hyatt Place was closest to University of Chicago. Hyatt, uh, University of Chicago. So I'm going to guess that this is the north north of the campus. Um, so 52. Yes, that's that's slightly. Yeah, that's north of the campus. So it's south as it gets bad. So you get north. Okay, yeah. So we so we did that whole walk, and it wasn't great, but uh, yeah, we, we, it wasn't yeah. like I would could never imagine living around here. Yeah. No. If you go to if you go to the south, uh, the University of Chicago also has its private security system where they so yeah. they have a they have a person on like every mm-hmm. block of at night. But um, yeah, the the you're you're on the better side. Um. You're on the better side of the uh, the university there. Um, okay, yeah, that's yeah, that's 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 interesting. I, I do think, yeah, I think you're, I think you're, I think you're right that we can't just you know sort of just be, you know, wild and speculative. Uh, with What's your crime your, like where you are, Richard? Uh, I live outside of uh, Los Angeles. I live in a very Asian area, so uh, pretty okay, good. Hello. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty lovely. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the I, I, <laughs> are you scared to go to Hollywood or that kind of thing? You're no, like, I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm not that neuro- I'm not that neurotic about that. I mean, I've yeah. got these things. I you know, I just I I, 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 I have a, everything in Los Angeles seems low to me because I grew up in Chicago. I know what really ah. bad crime. <laughs> I know what a real high crime rate uh, looks like. Um, as, but yeah, nothing. Uh, pretty much nothing in Los Angeles is, is that bad. So I, I feel, you know, I feel. Have fine. you walked under the bridge next to the music center? Uh, where? Oh, that, in, that oh, they have, probably, that's probably the scariest place I ever saw in the United States. Yeah, they, they have a lot of homeless encampments. Yeah. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not scared of the. Yeah, the homeless. The, 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 mm. <laughs> they annoy me, but it's not. <laughs> it does. I don't. I, I, I didn't know what was going on, but I I was frightened. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's um. I, I, I just do think I do think that the Amer- I, I just do think that I, I don't know I, even if those estimates are off by a little bit they had what eleven they came up, but that Ben Southland guy came up with what like ten percent of GDP if it's yeah. if it's five percent of GDP and it's it's just instinctively it's believable to me that if you know your great cities your biggest cities twenty thirty percent of nobody wants to walk down the street in the middle of the day that could cost you five percent of GDP completely completely plausible to me mm-hmm. and it would be worth uh, yeah thinking about how to how to do something about that. Um, okay. Yeah. So I, I, other thing, I mean, I like, uh, I like what I think one of my favorites is essays from the book. And I think I read this, uh, when it was on the blog, um, it was called, uh, Patri- uh, it's uh, the Patria. Patria Parenti Amici. Yeah. So, uh, so it's basically your, you, the idea is that I, I why, don't, why don't you go ahead and explain it instead of me doing it. Right. So it's a quote from Rigoletto. So let's see, you know, country, you know, country family, friends, and it's, it's, it's really this question. So like, you know, how can you love your own family, but not have a strong bias in favor of fellow citizens? I right? maybe you'll say that it's just, you know, highly, you know, these, these two things are highly incompatible. It's basically the same thing. Like I love my country cause I'm born in the country. I love my kids cause they're born my kids. So what can we say about this? And I said, well, one thing is just that love of your kids is just much more evolutionarily deeply rooted. So it's much more of a fool's errand to try to do anything about it. Whereas on the other hand, people's sense of identity with their country is actually highly malleable. There is a famous book called Peasants and a Frenchman talking about how in 1800, hardly anyone in France thought they were French. And then they changed their minds with a bunch of public education telling them, yeah, we're all French here. Everyone is French. Got it? We're all French. Do that long enough. Uh, so that's you know, part of it, just realizing this is a much more flexible thing. So it does make sense to say, well, can we go and make it a, and make it bigger, make it a more encompassing category? Then I say, but the, like the really the much bigger difference between loyalty to family and loyalty loyalty to country is that almost everyone will admit that favor that there are many ways in which favoring your family is just morally wrong. If you are judging a Taekwondo tournament and you rule in favor of a kid because he's your kid. Almost everyone admits that's wrong, and there are there are norms saying don't do that. Try to judge it fairly, put aside family loyalty, and just give it to kids based upon merit. 
And yet at the level of country, there's almost none of that. At the level of country, there is so little attention paid to, yeah, well, it is your country that did it, but maybe your country was in the wrong with this one if you really looked at the facts. So I know you're someone who cares a lot about wrong things the U.S. has done in the world, the way the U.S. will just negligently go and invade Afghanistan or Iraq. And yet most Americans just don't really care about that. I remember there's a story about the first George Bush. Uh, you might remember that there was a time when the U.S. shot down an Iranian passenger airliner over, I think, the Persian Gulf. Do you remember this story, Richard? Uh, that sounds... Um... That sounds familiar. Under right. the first so, term- so anyway, so George, so basically Iran asked for, asked for an apology, and the original George Bush says, look, I don't apologize for America. I'm not an apologize for America kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's become famous. Yeah. you shoot down an innocent passenger airliner in peacetime, and you like won't even say, sorry. Like, that is a mentality that is actually very widely spread. Whereas on the other hand, you know, like, if you were to go and, like, you know, step on another kid's foot and you see the parent there. It's like, Hey, I like, or like your kid steps on the other kid's foot. What do you say as a parent? Like, Oh, I apologize for my kid. My kid did something wrong. And then you tell your kid, yeah, like, like we're very sorry for this. You don't say my kid right or wrong. Have you thought about what I say is that this loyalty to family is, you know, is actually basically, you know, not only is it very deeply rooted and so pointless to try to really get rid of it, but it's also one that we've already got a very strong recognition of its limits. Whereas we really have not yet contained the, the the feelings that people have of national loyalty, which are still quite out of control. So there's another comparison that I, I've always found interesting. So you have this national loyalty, you have uh, family um, as as a you know as a as a justification to treat some people better than others. But then you also have you know what we call racism, um, which is treating some people. It's sort of you know this uh, it's sort of the, the I've seen people describe it as sort of an extended family. And this is another one. <coughs> where we say we, we take an even harder line than we do on the family stuff. We yeah. say you really have to go out of your way never to do that and never to uh, treat, you know, treat someone differently on account of their, at least if you're, if you're white, if you're, yeah, yeah. there's a massive double standard, of yeah. course, of course. <laughs> and so, but, but th- that's interesting. It seems like we have a, we have a very special carve out mm-hmm. for national. It's like, you know, if, if you say, I, I, I don't care about American workers anymore than Chinese workers or whatever, you know, that, that people will attack you on that ground. Nobody, no, you know, Biden or, you know, no, not even a left-wing politician will, uh, will take that, uh, will take that position. Um, and so like, we just have this carve out where it's like the, the nation is like this one thing where you can just arbitrarily prefer people. And you're not only like, it's yeah. okay. It's like morally, you're morally yeah. obligated to. Yeah. What's wrong with you? It, yeah. It, it, like, it's odd. Well, I, mean, you know, I mean, of course, also for ancestry, as long as it's a national ancestry, then again, it's like, well, I can favor fellow Romanians and you're not the world's worst person. I mean, there is the cognitive dissonance of, yeah, but like Romanians are all white. So it's really, a, <laughs> it's, oh, well, what do we say about that? So Yeah. But it, cause it's not, cause it's not about white versus non-white. So if like, if there's a black net, if there's a naturalized black Romanian, right, then it would be morally acceptable. You couldn't for <laughs> the white Romanian over the black Romanian. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it, I mean, can this, it's, I, I think if people, somebody was going to justify nationals, this is how I've heard it, justified, it's like, it's like the basis of society. So if you, if you have, if you're Ameri- if we're all Americans, um, and we start dividing ourselves according to race and say whites could favor other whites, et, et cetera, you know, that'll tear our country apart. If we all say we're all, if we say we're all Americans and, you know, we all, we all care about each other and we love each other, we're one big happy family, um, that's good for social harmony. I guess that's the argument. Something. Yeah, like you that. say it's at least good for domestic harmony. Of course. Well, what about world harmony? <laughs> yeah, we get right. way too into being, I don't know, Germans or something, and then what might happen? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's you're right. The, the, I so you could make the argument the opposite. It's a the nation is the most dangerous one because it's 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 cor- it's um, it has a relationship with state power. Where like if you have white nationalism in the American context, you know there's no white uh, nation state, so it would be like it would just be one thing among um, other things, um, and you know like the white yeah, race. If it gets to the level where you might have a civil war, then yeah, you should be really worried. Yeah, uh, it's right. Just, um, you know, just a few losers complaining to each other. Yeah, I'm not gonna worry about. Yeah, that. It, yeah, exactly. There's so like the white race. danger to each other, really. 
Yeah. Yeah. So like the white race starting a war against other races, like much lower probability than the American nation starting a you know a war against some, some other nation, uh, obviously. Um, so if you could ever read the Wikipedia articles for any white nationalist organization. The level of intra white nationalist violence is one to like, <laughs> like, like if you want to preserve, if you want to keep white people safe, don't join that group because they kill each other. Like, yeah. They, you know, uh, under the American Nazi party got killed by another party member in a laundromat not far from here. Yeah, yeah. Are you talking about uh, uh, the uh, the guy uh, Rockwell? What's his name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 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 blanking out. Lincoln's in his name too. I'm blanking. George, I think it's George Lincoln. Lincoln Rockwell. Yeah, he used yeah. to. He used to, He was a big performance artist. He would go at like a Nazi uniform to uh, uh, college. I want to make sure that's his name, George Lincoln. Uh, Rockwell. Yeah. So that, that is, that is common. Um, yeah. yeah. It is George Lincoln Rockwell. Uh, yeah, that, that is, that is common. I, you know, I think what it, the, you have, you have, you have an essay on white nationalism too. Uh -huh. <laughs> and your argument is that basically because they are so, um, you know, it's so taboo, even though like say communism might have a higher, uh, yeah. Like way higher. Yeah. yeah maybe Twitter will kick you off for being white nationalists probably, yeah. but yeah. there's, Lots of little little hammer and sickle logos in Twitter profiles. No one's getting kicked off for that. But your argument, and your argument is, and this would this would uh, this would uh, uh, make sense out of that idea that white nationalists are so eternally violent. It's the idea that if you go out of your way to accept this philosophy that everyone rejects, there's probably something wrong with you, right? Where if you do, yeah. you have to go out of your way to be evil. Yeah, I mean, I like I would be scared to be around them, <laughs> just, like just because they've got a bad track record. And what kind of a person would join it? Mm -hmm. but, you know, like, like you know, it's like me you to know, start off by saying, look, intrinsically, there's nothing worse about white nationalism than black nationalism. It's just the same idea with find and replace for the name. But if there is a kind of nationalism where there's enormous stigma against it, then generally it is going to be very odd people that are going to get into it. And that's what I say you know, is why I judge them very negatively. I, you know, like I said, like if you just meet a random member of the Nazi party in Germany in the mid 30s, they're probably fairly normal people, right? They're probably not planning on killing anyone. Uh, the, the, the movement is dangerous, but it would, I wouldn't have been afraid just to be in the same room with, with, with a member, whereas I would be afraid to be in the same room with a member of the American Nazi Party. It's like, what kind of a psycho joins the American Nazi Party? <laughs> someone with deep convictions about, you know, what's right yeah. and wrong. <laughs> yeah, you know, someone wrong. who's not just saying, well, this is what other people are doing. I guess I'll go with the flow, but rather, yeah, everybody hates this stuff, but I love it gonna do it yeah so so you um have you uh so you recently i think wrote an article about um uh how sort of you've you've come to see wokeness as more of a serious problem can you talk about sort of your your evolution here and obviously it's related to the book right it basically starts with i discount all media scandals as being totally unrepresentative of the real world and just trying to get clicks by terrifying people and normally this heuristic works really well and almost everything on the news no matter how horrifying is an ultra rare event and really shows nothing about the world. But the wokeness on the other hand was a case where it just started in university since the same university professor. I know about it. I've seen it here. I've always thought it was terrible for me, but at the same time I'd see stories and I'd be like, all right, well, this is like one tiny corner of the world where this is an issue. It's bad for me because I happen to be really close to the epicenter of this junk, but it doesn't mean that normal people need to be worrying about it. And furthermore, I've long had the view that the rhetoric is just so academic. It's just so off-putting, off so full of jargon. There's a great Noam Chomsky essay saying, please, leftists, just drop this horrible continental philosophy. It alienates normal people from our movement. And I'm like, yeah, good, good. Right? And so for, you know, this, is, this, this was my attitude for many years of the wokeness is bad for me, but it doesn't really matter very much in the real world. And then it just started maybe about eight years ago, having a growth rate of like 50% per year in the real world. And first I'm like, eh, it can't really be, can't really be, right? But like if you have a 50% growth rate compounded over six years, then suddenly something that was a rounding error is no longer a rounding error. Uh, what really blew my mind was after the George Floyd riots, I suddenly found that all of my friends with normal non-academic jobs had to do brainwashing sessions. And this is where I real, and I actually was looking over their shoulders sometimes, seeing their brainwashing sessions, saying, look, this is the same kind of intellectually insipid person that would normally be doing training in diversity here on a university campus. But now they're torturing people in the insurance industry with this stuff, like normal people who have like in no way chose to be part of this, ac of, of academia. And they're still having to listen to this horrible, turgid dogma. 
And when I saw that happening to people who had never opted in to academia, I just felt really sorry for them and outraged on their behalf, I will say. It's like, it's ridiculous that normal people would have to deal with this stuff. And now they are. And this is not just something that's only on the news. Something is happening to people in real life. So that was my main transformation of just realizing that it had gone from being a you know, something that was prominent in a very tiny corner of the world to something that actually is prominent in like all at really at all levels of high skilled employment at minimum. Uh, they just managed to somehow get their growth rate up to a level that I could not imagine for people with jargon like intersectionality. That's just the kind of thing that I would think would forever bar you from having any broader audience. But somehow they pulled it off. Yeah. So I mean, the, the you know, it's it's interesting because yeah, there's this sort of this uh, this stuff about you know the the sort of the uh, academic sort of framing of this stuff, the you know the ideas, but there's also sort of this more low key kind of you know affirmative action and diversity stuff. I was looking at some n uh, demographics of NASA this mo uh, this morning. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like 11% of NASA is black, like 8% is Asian. Like, wow, that's like, you guys have, don't look like any science or technology company um, in the world. And, you know, you did that, you didn't need like, you know, uh, white fragility, like readings in order to, uh, uh, in order to get that. That's just like, you know, old school affirmative action. We've been doing government hiring that we've been doing since the, uh, basically the 1960s or 1970s. And, you know, the, this stuff, it's like, it's, there's, there's stuff is everywhere and it's like, like, you know, it, it, I, I see it as a constant, you know, drag on our society. And so it's like, sometimes like, you, you might not see that. Like you wouldn't, you don't work with NASA. You wouldn't, you know, see that on a daily basis, but it's like. Yeah, my father-in-law actually worked for them. Okay. Did he, did, did, what was his long, opinion? Long ago, but, uh, you know, in, in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's like, there's, there is this, you know, stuff that like just this idea that you should treat people, you know, that you, you have to make this numerical quotas. It's sort of like everything has to be centered around that. That's just been there for a while. Uh, but like the sort of the manifestation, the brainwashing sessions and stuff, that's like, you know, it, it became more strenuous in the last, you know, five or six years, like you say. Right. And, you know, I mean, but it's also true that there are many places that, rhetorically took this stuff super seriously for decades that only recently decided that they totally believe it. So for example, you know, Harvard has had affirmative action for black students for a very long time, but now they are admitting them at 50% above their base rate in the population. Oh, really? Is that right? Yeah. By the way, I think, I think this, I think this, um, a lot of, I think a lot of these race numbers are just nonsense. I was at the Caltech graduation recently. If you look at the official statistics, like Caltech is like 20% black or Hispanic. Mm -hmm. You, you could just look at the graduated class. It, yeah. You don't see any black people. They're supposedly five to 10% of the school. They, you know, I, I don't know if this is a, I don't know if this is a, uh, this is a real change or it's just a change in how people are identifying based on, um, distant ancestry or they're just lying. I mean, there's no penalty. There's no detection for just that uh, year. You could say we're black. And, you know, if we were uh, applying for undergrads to undergraduates today. So I wonder how much, you know, I wonder <laughs> you're, maybe you're just selecting for, uh, you're just selecting for willingness to lie. I mean, that, that could be all you're doing here because there's no verification of the system at all. Yes. I mean, my immediate reaction to that is the change was so quick in just the last couple of years, but I mean, I suppose there could be, uh, but both changes could be going on. There could be a lot, much stronger affirmative action, but also a lot more lying. Uh, you know, so the uh, you know the supply of lies will uh, rise as demand for lies. <laughs> You'll move along the supply curve, uh, perhaps. Although, uh, you know, to be like real textbook econ, you might, there might even be a long run shift in response to the perception of growing opportunities. So. Yeah. So the, the the corporate brainwashing, it's interesting you, you mentioned that. So a lot of uh, conservative uh, people will say, uh, you know, this shows the sort of the inadequacy of libertarianism. I think what you need to do is you just need to ban this stuff. You need to do some kind of, you know, DeSantis thing where you, uh, you bring, you sort of whites under civil rights law and you just, you just sort of bring the hammer down on this stuff. Um, you know, what, what do you think about that? Right. Well, so the you know, first thing that's pretty obvious is there's actually places that do have laws explicitly against political discrimination, such as Washington, D.C. And guess what? Doesn't seem to do any good. Yeah. Well, what there's about what about more specific? The people about that are actually in charge of enforce the law just uh, yeah. do, do not agree. Maybe, with maybe they're not specific yeah. enough. Maybe you need to just ban critical race theory and ban gender theory. And, and, and that's that's it. Right. As to like what good that would do in D.C. is pretty hard to understand. Uh, right. You know, in an area in a, like in another area, then you know, maybe it would work. Uh, but this was actually one of my earliest arguments with you where I said that, look, you, it is important to realize that, it, that a lot of what's going on is that, is that you know, there's just way too little 
variety in what firms are doing for this to be just based upon supply and demand. Right? Like you, it's pretty much impossible to find any corporation where they just have an ethos of colorblindness, for example, and they and they have a lot of propaganda on the wall, say, be colorblind. This is a colorblind company. Don't know, think before you make an accusation against someone. It could be unfair. Right? You're not going to find any place like that. And I mean, as to what's going on, my story is, look, if you were the one company that was doing that, you probably would get sued into the ground. Right. So the, law, you know, so the legal climate is such that you don't want to obviously be doing less than anybody else, uh, which I think means that the law is actually quite crucial. I mean, just think about this. If it were really true that the major corporations were governed by total true believers, why do they even have a legal team that tries to go and minimize the damage from the lawsuits they get for discrimination violations? It is not true that if you go and try suing Disney, they just say, oh, my God, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, let's give them $20 million. That's not what they're going to do. Instead, they are going to tell their lawyers, uh, let's fight this thing. So like, they are not, you know, like when money is on the line, they actually are still interested in having their money. So I think it is much better to think about the environment that we have as you know, partly there is a variety and some people genuinely and sincerely believe this stuff and want it. So even there, they're not willing to pay their whole business in order to be true believers. But but secondly, like you know, the very fact that we just see so little variety is a sign that there's a lot of fear of the law. And if we were to deregulate, that a lot of the variety that we currently don't see would yeah. very likely come. Oh, I, I don't know why if we had an argument on that. I, I agree with you. I you know, yeah. very you know, so basically, like like in your original piece on why is every why is everything woke? Then at least I don't, I don't think that you mentioned the law. And then I said I think the law is actually something that's important. And then you had a follow up piece where you did say exactly that. So. Yeah. Well, maybe, a, maybe we agreed all along, and it just wasn't obvious from the first. Well, it's a, it's a force. It's a force amplifier because it's. Yes. And sometimes people bring up OPR in the media. You know, a lot of times you'll find out that you know the statistics on bad diversity numbers come out through lawsuits, and they come out through like California has like laws where you disclose like they're trying to do something where you have to disclose how much each race and <coughs> gender. Owns. So it's like yeah, it's law and it, and it's PR. It's very synergi synergistic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the law is yeah important. Yeah, that's that's one of my uh, you know big ideas um right although you know like like, like your original piece said it is probably true that leftists are more likely to boycott a firm because they don't like their demographics than conservatives are yeah you know? i think that's true i think yeah. that's that certainly like you know the conservatives could find out that disney was super woke and yet if their kids want to go and watch disney movies they'll still probably subscribe yeah Whereas, i think that's the like, you know, leftists uh you know, like if it were the other way around they'll say no no, no our kids can't see this stuff this is poison <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even there, like important not to exaggerate, and the, like the, the the fanatics are the most prominent, but they are not the most prevalent. Yeah. So let me ask you about you do uh, you did uh, uh, stand up comedy recently. What what made you want to do that? I thought that I thought you were pretty funny. Um, was, oh, thank, pretty thank you, thank you, Richard. I mean, there's a few things. So I'm a, I am a professional public speaker, and I'm always curious. Well, could I do a different kind of public speaking? So I've done a bunch of different kinds, and. It seems like a lot of lessons transfer. Stand-up comedy, it's quite different in a, in a bunch of ways. So that was part of what just made me wonder, could I do it? I like stand-up comedy a lot. I you know, My kids consider me funny. I like telling <laughs> jokes a lot. <laughs> so like, you know, part, you know, part of hanging out with me is I just see a lot of humor in the world. The world seems ridiculous to me in a lot of ways. And much of the joy in life just comes from appreciating this and talking about it. Uh, then, you know, like I think early, early in COVID, one of the things I was doing just to occupy my spare time and new bandwidth of being so lonely was I started creating a wiki of funny ideas for stand-up comedy. So, I mean, I wound up having like eight pages of ideas that I collected over two years. Then what actually happened was that I was invited to be on the Comedy Cellar podcast, which is kind of like a Joe Rogan podcast where it's comedians who want to talk about serious issues. So it's not comedians being funny, mostly. There's a little humor, but it's mostly comedians who just want to talk about real stuff. I got invited on that. And then at the end, after we stopped filming, I started telling the owner of the club about how I had this dream of doing stand-up comedy, and I was jealous of them that they got to do it. it seemed like it'd be really cool. And then he said, oh, all right, well, if you want to do it, send me a reel. So I said, all right, yeah, like, seriously? You know, really? Like, yeah, yeah. So like, you know, if it's... You know, if it's bad, then that's the end of it. If it's good, then you can perform. Come here and perform. And I said, okay. So I, mean, I wrote it up and I shot the video and sent it to him. He said, oh yeah, it's good enough for you to come perform here. So I said, all right. Um, yeah, and then you know, like you know, the main thing that is really different between my normal public speaking and that is the memorization. 
right? So you've really got to memorize it because you can say two sentences that are equivalent of meaning, but one is hilarious and one is not funny at all. And so you like when you write comedy, you need to be thinking about this. You know, real comedians would be doing A-B testing a hundred times before their Netflix special. So you know, each for every part saying, I'll try it this way, try it that way, see which one gets the better audience reaction. I actually was performing at New Comedy Night where there's a bunch of people that are just trying out totally new material normally. Um, I mean, overall, I, I felt very happy that it went on the theory. Look, it was like me and about nine professional comedians. And I was not obviously the worst person. Mm. <laughs> you obviously have a talent. Yeah. You and, then, a- you know, obvi- you know, and then major bonus, there was an actual famous comedian, uh, Andy Haynes, who came on after me. And he immediately came up with some impromptu comedy about me that I thought was hilarious. So even if I suck, his, his jokes about me are clearly funny. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, are, is this going to become a, I mean, I've always sort of had that too. It's like uh, the, you know, could I do something else? So I've sort of, I've yeah. always been enamored by the idea of writing fiction, movies, TV, never had the time for it. You know, I, I always think maybe I could do it, but there's always, yeah, I think there's, you know, sometimes people have this, can I take my talents and do something else? Would I be, you know, as, as good at it or, or, you know, decent at it? Yeah. I mean, uh, that's how I got started in graphic novels. I was just a fanboy, And then I said, could I do one of these myself? Well, I can't draw. I'm not going to learn how to do that. But could I go and write the script and do the storyboards? And that's how my book, Open Borders, got started. So I just started playing around with some software and trying to do it. And I said, eh, I think this is pretty good. If I could get an artist to draw it, then it could be really good. I'm wrapping up a second nonfiction graphic novel. And the first one was a bestseller. So I think the answer to can I do this is clearly yes, if I can get a New York Times bestseller out of it. I actually write a lot of fiction before role-playing games. So I, I've written you know, hundred, like well over a hundred different role playing games that I play mostly with my kids and friends, and it always begins with an original story, right? I, I write in lots of different genres. I do horror, crime, superheroes, historical fiction. I had a whole time travel series that I wrote. Oh, where, where can we find this stuff? You, you your historical ah, novels. So if you go to my web page and click on the fun section, I've got a sampling. Honestly, I have over 10 what's your, what's your times page, Brian, on, on the GMU. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, bkaplan.com, click uh, on the left bar, click on fun, scroll down, and you will see a bunch of things that I've written. Right now, I have written well over 10 times as much stuff, but actually, I've never gotten any, I barely get any positive feedback over it, so I'm not motivated to do more. If I just got some emails from people saying, oh, I played your game, it was great, then I'd probably put up a ton more, but uh no, where's the uh, where's the so fun lectures? Where's the where's like the the historical novels you see? You have a you have a. Let's see. So let me I, let me double check. So let's see. We go click on. Let's see. B. Kaplan, fun, and then scroll down to RPG resources. Right, so there I've got uh, Cowboy Zombie, Cowboy Martian, a punctuated equilibrium, which is a. Uh, Alien Apocalypse uh, story. These are stories that form the basis for a role-playing game. game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So these are all different stories about... Where basically, like, like you, the idea of a role-playing game is that it's an interactive story. So the players are able to change what the story is like. That's a lot of the fun. Is There's sort of an environment that you create. There is a, a something that is going to happen unless the players intervene. And then good players derail the story and make something really fun happen. Mm. So, yeah. So, like... I've got, well, I have one, which is basically an original uh, Lemony Snicket story. Uh, the Undesirables, that one is one of my favorites. This one, you play a bunch of mafioso in 1924, uh, trying to solve a mystery. So you're actually the classic New York gangsters investing <laughs> in mystery. That one is fun. Uh, and then I've actually got a couple that I wrote specifically for my daughter. Right, so I've got uh, that I and I also made up a new system that would be easier for younger kids. Wait, what's so what's for your daughter? Yeah, so the bottom the uh, the fox trap. This is a story about a ten year old girl growing uh, in Colorado in the seventies who's able to speak with animals. Okay, and she understands the speech of animals, and then so basically the characters are the girl, and everyone else plays her animal companions, and they have an adventure. So I sort of think of it as like a wonderful world of Disney story transplanted to the modern day just, 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 have you ever thought about selling these i was at a game store at the mall and it's amazing the sophistication of these things that are that are out there have you ever thought about trying to trying to market these yeah i mean like the amount of extra work i have to put into it to be competitive is just too high 
I mean, like I, I be, you know, I would be happy in just sharing what I've already done. I mean, honestly, actually, another issue is there probably be fairly serious copyright issues with a lot of the stuff because I actually cast them with real photographs of real actors at different stages of their career. Uh, and so for me, this is part of the fun is it's sort of getting to be fantasy movie director. If I had an unlimited budget and a time machine and I was casting the story, who would be in the story? And that's what you get to do as a you know, in a game. But you know, there'd probably be some issues. At least I have to get deal with copyright compliance, which is gotten up to obnoxiously high levels okay so brian i think you have we're, we're coming up on a, a hard time limit is, is that right? right that is right but uh, yes yeah, so the new book is don't be a feminist essays on genuine justice you can get it from amazon despite overwhelming inflation these days i have kept the price at a constant nominal amount of 12 bucks for the paperback and 9.99 for the ebook i think if you have an open mind, you know, so I'm picturing that your readers are probably not going to just be massively turned off by the title. I did have a lot of pushback. This is the only thing I've ever written where I had multiple friends privately staging mini interventions saying, look, you're going to destroy your career. This is career suicide. You're going to make a a mess of your whole reputation. If you go and publish this book, I will say that any of those people are listening. I appreciated what you did. You cared. Like you stuck your necks out in order to go and help me, and I never want to discourage friends from doing that and speaking their mind. I did spend about a month thinking, should I listen to them or not? In the end, I decided I want to stick with this. This is not a, a title that I've picked out of anger or in any kind of fit of rage, or it is not a reflection of any sort of woke derangement syndrome. This is an essay I've been writing in my head for about 10 years. I finally got around to writing it. And the title is not meant to be in any way hostile. The title rather is meant to just accurately express the point of the essay, which is to say feminism is a view that is deeply false. And if you are not one yet, don't join. And if you are one, disaffiliate. Yeah. I was, I was so intrigued by this because I, I, I got into some debates with people in your comments on uh, the mm-hmm. replies on, on Twitter. Um, and I, I was trying to think like, you know, if, we take their concerns seriously and you say what like what what was the other like i was trying to i was asking i was uh debating this one uh i, I think woman in the uh in the replies that i said you know what kind of you know what what do you think would be a good good title like how could you you know because because these people would say oh that you're arguing really not against like you know the 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 you know the uh definition of feminism were just you know political, social, economic equality, whatever. You're arguing against some branch of feminism. And so like- You have a 95% branch. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. And then, so there's just the truth aspect. But then the, just this, the marketing aspect, you say, don't be, you know, don't be a um, statistically illiterate, you know, feminist. Don't be, or you'd say, don't be a, you know, what, what, you know, it's, 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 you need, you need something that sort of gets at the heart of what you're saying. And I think it's just like so difficult for the, for people to, you know, it, it, you know, I, I don't think this is a conscious strategy, but this thing of like, okay, feminism, when we don't, we're going to strategically change the definition based on what's going on. When we want to talk about feminism, we're going to use this definition that everyone agrees with. When you criticize uh, feminism, that's not feminism. You're being decisive, but you're divisive by calling that feminism. And so, you know, it, it's like, I understand the, uh, the need to, um, you know, not turn people off, um, you know, uh, 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 needlessly, but at the same time, it's like if you play along with this, it's almost it's it's almost impossible to to say anything. I mean, because you, you're just gonna you know, and also make it you know marketable and you know interesting and punchy, right? Yeah, I mean, so, and also I thought that I was able to convey the tone very well with the artwork on the cover. You know, the artwork it is not one showing me arguing with feminazis or whatever term of disparagement you want. It's a picture of me homeschooling my daughter, teaching her economics, teaching her psychology, teaching her critical thinking. If someone looks at that and just says, "You monster," it's like, look, look. Obviously, I don't have a problem with women. I, you know, you know this, this is. The, I, I took a special effort to go and write an essay. You know, honestly, like, like I can really say, like. If this essay stops my daughter from being a feminist, then I don't really care what the other effects are. <laughs> it was worth it, yeah. I, I, I love her a lot more than 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 the other people that might not like it. Uh, so yeah, like you know, like you know, this is something where like you know she was on my mind very much, and I said look, I, I look this is something that I feel like I've got at least a ten percent chance of fixing just by writing an essay. So I'm going to stick my neck out. 
course, there's always going to be people saying, well, what will you do if she becomes one instead? It's like, yeah, I'm going to just disown her and say I'll never talk to her again now. Like, it's not like that. <laughs> it's going to be one where at least she will know where I stand, and it's going to be pretty hard to caricature me because I wrote it. Yeah. Okay, well, Brian, I'm... She's, a, she's a good girl. She's loyal. I, 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 I've got my chips bet on her. Yeah, I think yeah, I think your your odds are not as bad as you think because you know genetic you know genetics is a thing yeah. you know political views. Yeah, are. There's, there's genetics and and also in terms of the effect of family environment. I thought about this a lot when I was homeschooling my kids, which is well, one possibility is that parenting doesn't matter very much. Another one is that parents don't try nearly hard enough on things that they really want to get. I think that's I yeah. Think so that's like, if you really want your your kid to learn Korean. It can be done. It's just going to be a lot of work, but it's doable. It's just that within the normal range of speaking, well, do I speak five Korean words or 50? That's not going to matter. You've got to go and do 50,000 if you really want to make it happen. So similarly, you know, some of my things is, look, you know, for a lot of things, it's just not worth it trying to go and change your kids, even if you could. But for something that really matters, like are they going to be consumed by a doctrine of antipathy and self-pity? That's something where I'll say it's worth talking about it day after day, writing essays and not being, not being hostile, but being friendly. You know, saying, look, you can talk to me about anything. Whatever they tell you in school, I'm here. Let's discuss. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I encourage everyone to read it. It's a great essay. Don't be a feminist, and all the other essays are are great too. I've uh, I've read most of them over the years, but people who haven't you know read them, they need they yeah. you, it's it's just great. I, you know, the uh, mm-hmm. uh, great introduction to Cap Caplian thinking on a wide range of issues. So yeah, I mean, everyone, just think of the the convenience factor of having me curate the top, the five percent best essays. I think is really high because the number of people that is going to go back and read an entire seventeen years of a blog. Is yeah. Too much. Yeah. So get the book and then also yeah. So get the books and then also subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to the uh, Substack so you don't miss anything in the future. And uh, yeah, next book we'll we'll have you on again, Brian. Great. All right. All right. Awesome. All right. Have a great day, Richard. See you later.